I would like to recognize all the mothers here in the room. So, can we all give a round of applause to all our mothers? Because I'm going to have a time to pray for them. The mothers to Jesus. Let us have a time to pray. Lord, we are thankful for this time that we come to your presence and remember how you are love. And because of that love, we also see the embodiment of that love from our mothers. And as we come to this day, even though it is a recognition and gratitude that we show and should show every day, we give thanks for our mothers. We give thanks because of their sacrificial love. We give thanks for their presence. And we give thanks for who we are because of them. And I pray that you will be with all our mothers and mothers should be. That this day, that they will be embraced by your love. And be filled with the grace that only comes from you. As we come to you and the Lord and the Word, Lord, we ask that you will be with us and you will continue to speak through us. Let this time be our act of living worship. May our lives be a worship to you. And as we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, Lord, we also ask that you will accept these gifts that is yours and use it for your glory. As we continue to strive for your words and as we continue to be transformed by your words, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be worthy in front of you, my Lord, my rock, my Savior, my foundation. And may you be glorified in all that we do. We thank you and pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I want to start uh, by also calling out another person. <coughs> Philip Parr, I don't know if you know him, uh, and you will know him, just know him by name, but Philip is there sitting in the sound booth, and exactly a year minus one day ago, he came to Roanoke to start his journey of recovery, and tomorrow is going to be his one-year anniversary. It's immediately, almost immediately after he came and joined the program at Re Rescue Mission, he got to visit our church. Was it... How many times did you do the visit before our church, Philip? Once. So there's only one church before our church, and the next Sunday he came, and he and three other men decided to come and just make this his faith community. And ever since, he has always been there with us, also for the first sight service, being in charge of that sound booth. Philip, I... I just want to congratulate you on your achievement. Let's give him a big... <laughs> so today is a little weird Sunday. because The reason why I say weird is because my sermon will not be concluded until you see the musical. <laughs> I am not threatening you to come to our musical, but... Uh, if you would like to see the, the, the ending or conclusion, you can always tune in on our online streaming service. It, it's going to start at 11 o'clock and you can see it again. So today we're, gonna t we're actually going to have a musical, enjoy the musical of Jesus Christ and his journey to the temple. And what I thought might be interesting for First Light Service is that we do something to talk more about the history and the background of this whole incident. Because like Ashley said, how in the world did this mother and father lose God's child? You know, the weight of it, it's just so immense. But I would say the more I get into it and the more I got to learn a little bit more about it, I think I understand. But even in all those history and the facts, I think there is something that we can learn from. So there is going to be a musical today, and I, I really think that the children, choir, and the parents, and where's Deborah? Deborah had did a great job, so please uh, continue to remember them in your prayers. I wanted to go straight into the word that is from Luke chapter 2. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 42. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as a usual for the festival. So there's two things that we need to remember. First, Passover. Passover is one of the most central idea, or I can even say an event in the time of this Jewish community creating their identity. So Passover, as you all remember, Passover is a time where the Israelites were under the reign of the Egyptians. And God had heard the cry of God's people. And God sent Moses saying that I heard the cry of my people. I want you to go to Pharaoh and ask them to come and worship me. And as you all know the story, Pharaoh says no. And then more we see in the Bible, according to the Bible, in the perspective of the Bible, God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. And there is ten plagues that is needed to show not only God's power, but also to struck down the hardened heart of Pharaoh. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the final one, as you all know, is God warning that every firstborn in the nation will be, will have no life the next day. But there is an exception. What is the exception? The exception is that anyone who follows God will sacrifice a lamb and through the lamb and the blood of the lamb they will put a sign on their doorpost and whenever the spirit of life comes and takes away the life of the firstborn the spirit will pass over that door that's what Passover is all about so Passover is actually the event that form the identity of this nation. And every year, actually there's three times of the year that Jewish people are to travel all the way to Jerusalem, wherever they are, three times of the year. The first one is Passover. As we all know, it's around this time. As we remember, Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal and then got crucified. So that's why Easter and Passover are almost identical. And then there's one, two more, which is late spring, probably early summer, when we, then when the, when at that time in the agricultural, cult, agricultural society where they got the first crops, that's when they do the second uh, journey to Jerusalem. And the third one is probably around our Thanksgiving time, that is also uh, giving thanks of all the crops. So there's three required journeys that every Jew has to make to Jerusalem. But I want to share a little bit more about the Passover for Jesus. Passover was celebrated for approximately eight days. And I want to ask, what in the world happened during these eight days? There's a lot of feasting, but there's also a lot of community. For the community of God's people to come together and remember who they are and remember how we live. So the Passover Seder, I have only been to a, a, a condensed version of it. I hope that I can go to a real Seder meal. But the Seder, as I know, is designed to remember how God's grace has been upon this nation. So there are many things that they go and they go and they talk about a story. They do this and there's horseradish over there. And it is to remind them the bitterness of slavery. Uh, the only thing was horseradish was so good I liked it. So I don't know if I mean that I like <laughs> like the bitterness of slavery. I just love horseradish. Um, but other than that, it is an opportunity for them to go and talk about the story. But more than that, this is another thing. I, I understand that the house head of the table or the household are to lead not only the story of how God had pulled them out of Egypt, but also talk about the story of God had worked in their lives. 
So this was an, this was an opportunity for, in a way, discipleship to happen. In a way to share how God had worked in the life of God's people. Now there's one thing that I do have to point out. The recent shooting at the synagogue in San Diego had happened at the last day of Passover. And I just want to remind you of how this all worked. They were talking about how God had delivered them and they are in front of another tragedy. The strength of the people of God is that despite this tragedy, they'll remember the story of Passover and they will be victorious again. That's what Jesus had done. And his parents for the past 12 years had been bringing Jesus to the Passover gathering. And he had done it even in the time that we see in his public ministry for three times. He had observed the Passover and he actually died on the last Passover. If we go to the next scripture, it says, then it comes to that home alone moment that we have. Whether it was Jesus who was crying out or it was Mary who was crying out, it says when the festival was ended and they started to return, they were Joseph and Mary. The boy Jesus stayed behind Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it, assuming that he was in a group of travelers. They want, went a day journey and then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search him. So there's two things that you have to understand in order to make sure that this, is, this makes sense. Or we do not put Mary or Joseph as a, as a category of one of the worst horrible parents. So the first thing is how there are how they educate their child. So the first thing that we have to know that there was a complete separation of job, job description between the mother and the father. And, and it is understandable because they live in a patriotic society. So what happens is the mother has the responsibility to take care of a child until the child reaches adulthood. So let me start with this, breastfeeding. What is the norm for us to breastfeed in our society? How long are you to breastfeed your child? There are medical reasons why people might not do it. There are other social reasons why we don't do it anymore. But according to the Jewish culture, the length of breastfeeding is three years. So one thing that you will remember when Hannah had came to the temple and she was crying because she did not have a baby, right? You remember that story? She was crying and Eli saw him and she said, woman, why are you drinking in, at daylight? Go, go. And God had heard your request. And her request is for her to have a son. Because having a son meant in that society that her social status had been Confirmed. If you do not have a son at that time, I'm sorry, at that time, you were not considered at the, at the, at the normal stage as any kind of, to deserve any kind of human rights. At that time. I'm sorry. I knew that. But for her, I just, the reason why I say this is for her to say, if you give me a child, I will dedicate that child for you. You have to know how much of a sacrifice that she is making. And after three years of her weaning, uh, at breastfeeding and loving this child, she weans off the child and she sends him to the temple. So that's one thing about motherhood. There's another thing that mothers will be the, in the soul responsibility, have the sole responsibility of educating and nurturing the child until the child enters adulthood. So in Jewish community, what is the age of adulthood? 
You have your friends who have the mitzvah, and they will do it around the age of 13. Now, if you are 13 in that Jewish culture, you are considered as a full adult. Now, the reason why it happens like that, you'll see in the culture, or you'll see in the history, the more shorter people live, the younger the age of adulthood starts. So at that time, let's say that the average age of life expectancy <clears throat> probably might have been 50 or 60. That's the reason why adulthood started at 13. Now, us in our average life expectancy, let's say it's 70 to 80. What, time, what age does adulthood start? It's up to you to make that decision. We think it's 18, but we know that it is not. So that's where adulthood starts. And when adulthood starts, that's when the role of education is passed on to the father. And the father, before, 12, before 13, would not be that much involved in the life of the son. But when the son becomes 13, that's when the father starts his role. And his role is a little bit more of a disciplinary action. He wants to make sure that the son is tough enough to survive in this harsh world. And I know that we don't like it. And there is, a, up to a point, being disciplined too much that it will make you a felon. But the reason why that was, and I, I kind of reflect onto it, I remember the time that I was in boot camp. And I had this drill sergeant who was so harsh on us. And he was so tough on us. But the day that we graduated boot camp was the day I saw a completely different person. A person who was such loving figure and was making sure that we were prepared to go through our two years of service in the army. And I see that father figure more in that instead of seeing in our, in our way of putting them as a felon. Father figure at that time was a little bit more harsh. Now, why am I saying all this? Because it explains how they have might have lost Jesus. So when you are going to the Passover, because of all the threats and danger that might happen during the time of travel, people traveled in communities. So you will travel with the extended family. And when you are in this caravan, or may more like a convoy, this is what happens. The men, the adults, certain and above, will be in the front, and the back of the convoy. And women and children are in the middle. Right? Isn't that a natural thing whenever you're in a convoy? First in the back, the first will lead the way, and the back will make sure that anything is not falling out or everything is protected. And there are the women and the children in the middle of the convoy. So when they went to the Passover, they were all going in this convoy, and guess what? What? age with Jesus when we saw, first saw this scripture? He was 12 years old. Guess when the bar mitzvah happened? Not on his birthday. Because it happens in Jerusalem. So on his 12, when he's 12 years old, the next time he goes to Jerusalem, that's when his adulthood starts. So Jesus is now, after his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, is now considered as an adult. So they are coming back, and Mary, might have, and Mary and the relatives might have asked, where is Jesus? And she might have said, don't you remember? He's now an adult. He must be in the front or the back of the convoy with his father. On the other hand, Joseph might have said, and the relatives might have said, where is Jesus? He should be with us. And Joseph might have said, smish that kid. I think he still does not know how important it is to be an adult. He might be with his mother. Does this make sense? And they had went on a day-long journey. Why? Because from Jerusalem 
to Nazareth. It takes three days. Of course, if you go straight, it will be probably a day journey. But what they needed to do, they needed to go around the, the Samaritans. Because that's not, at that time, like I said, traditionally, that's not a clean area. So they will go around. And according to the research that I saw, they might have had their first stop at Jericho, which is a day-long journey. So this convoy was going on for a day, and at Jericho, they're now making sure that everybody is accountable, and Joseph and Mary comes to each other and says, where is Jesus? Mary might have said, how did Jesus do? And Joseph might have said, where in the world is he? He thinks he's still an adult. And that's when they got to know Jesus is not here. Did I redeem them a little bit? So it was not that horrible. And then go continue on to the scripture. <laughs> After three days, they found him in a temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, and note that his mother said something. Why? Because the mother was a sole educator at the time. Can you see the dynamic of what the mother said to him? Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Then it continues by saying, and he said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years, and in divine and human favor. What I really want to highlight is, did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? In the moment when Jesus became an adult, that was his time to solidify his identity as the son of God. He's no more a child in the society that needs the protection of his parents, even though he went back and he was obedient to them and he continued to grow in favor of the people and also God. But at this moment when Jesus became an adult, according to the tradition, he was proclaiming whom, who he was and whom he belonged to. And I think that's something that we might all have to think. Where does our identity lie in? One thing that we remember is that when Jesus was baptized, when he was coming out, a dove from heaven came and said, this is my son who I am pleased with. And I have been reading that over and over. And that's what, if you might recall, being baptized in our church, that's what I say. When you are baptized, of course, there's no sound effect of that happening. But I believe spiritually, that's what God is saying. You are my daughter and I am happy and pleased with you. And when Jesus had that baptism, it was a proclamation of him to continue to do God's will in the ministry as God's ch child, as God's son. But that identity was formed way before he was baptized. And when he knew whom he was and whom he belonged to, his way of growing and fo going forward to that ministry had made a difference. And that's where I found this, found this quote that says, your identity, identity lies not in what you do, but to whom you belong. And what happens for us in this world is that 
we, confused that our identity lies in what we achieve, instead of seeing whom we belong to. And in a sense, what we might have lost, we might have lost who we really are. At the end of the musical, Joseph, the musical actually ends by Joseph saying this, after all, it is not Jesus who was lost, but it was us who lost Jesus. Jesus was never lost because he knew who he was. But so many times, it is us who lose who we are that become lost because of not knowing who we are. So what is the power of faith? The power of faith is having the courage to say, I'm lost. I'm lost. I've been distracted by this world. I've been distracted. Forget who I was and whom I belong to. And saying I'm lost in a desperate call of asking God to redeem our identity in Him. As you remember, God hears that cry of our, in the midst of our lost. Of course, that cry might be a little bit more desperate when things don't go your way. That cry to God will be a little bit more sincere when you have a crisis in your life. But I'm a firm believer you don't have to wait until that crisis happens. When you know that I cannot live in this false identity. When you get to say, Lord, it's not what I had made or achieved, but it is whom I belong to that brings the true joy in my life. That is when you will see that we were once lost, but now are found that we are found by our shepherd, we are found by our creator, and we actually get to find our true identity. When we live with that identity, as it says at the end of the verse, as Jesus increased in wisdom and years, he earned the divine and human favor. So do you see your identity as a child of God? Do you want that identity to be found? It is simple. Come to God and say, I'm lost. But I know that you will restore whom I belong to. So let us have a time to pray. We wanted to open up this time for us to dwell in this moment. And reflect not only to the word, but to the word God is trying to convey to us. And I want to ask you to reflect and pray at this moment to embrace that message, embrace that identity. So let us have a time of prayer.
우리가 누구의 자녀인지 알게 하여 주시고 주의 자녀임을 통하여 주님의 능력을 경험케 하여 주시옵소서 Lord I'm lost Lord I'm lost not only because of what is happening around me, but more because maybe I might have been distracted to see who I truly am due to distractions of the world and distractions that pulls us away from our true identity. But let us remember that God, you are a God who is pleased with us. No matter who we are and no matter what we do, you are pleased with us because we are your children. And as your children come to you with the simple statement of saying, Lord, I'm lost. Hear their cry and deliver them from that despair. Pour out your Holy Spirit to transform them and mold them into your image. So they will continue to live and so we will continue to live. Following you in your favor and in the be with us, Lord, as we pray. We pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.